Okay. And the topic is here is entitled uh, Spiritual Lessons from D-Day. What is D-Day? In case you're not aware of it, today, yes, today is the 76th uh, anniversary of D-Day. And a lot of people wonder, what is D-Day? What does D stand for? Uh, does it mean uh, defense or oh. deliverance or whatever it is? But actually, D-Day is simply meant day. I mean, D-Day means that's the start, but in the D1, D2, D3, D4, D5, and so forth here. So mm -hmm. it doesn't mean anything like VE Day, Victory in Europe Day, or DJ Day, Victory in Japan Day. Uh, or something like that. But D-Day just simply means the day. And there's a lot of spiritual lessons we can gather, but this is uh, the anniversary of it. So we're going to go into it here. Well, we're talking about D-Day. In case you don't know what D-Day is, the May 10th and the May uh, 27th, 1940, something happened. It shook the world. As you may know that World War II, see, began in Europe, see, with the invasion of Poland in 1939. But it began two years earlier in the Pacific arena when Japan invaded, see, China. But here we have what's called the Blitzkrieg. Blitzkrieg means lightning warfare. In the lightning warfare, Blitzkrieg, what the Germans did is that they would sit a massive amount of tanks a massive amount of planes and artillery, and it will go through so fast, attack an unsuspecting country, that it just blitz right through it before they could even set up proper defenses. So in just two weeks, the German Nazi forces ran through Holland, Luxembourg, and Belgium, forcing these three countries circled in red here. But the main prize, that was not the main prize. The main prize was France. France, the most, at that time, considered to be the rival powerful country in continental Europe. If they could take over France, the rest of Europe will fall. As you see, Italy joined in. Spain was neutral, but Franco was a sympathizer to Adolf Hitler. And as you see in those arrows, See, the Germans went on seven cities they conquered to have a firm grip over the, the middle and northern part of France. And if you look, see, up here, I gave my little area, Dunkirk, this uh, site of a famous event here. Okay. What happened was that France, they lost the war two weeks later. They blundered. The way they blundered is that they selected a World War I hero, right? General C. Wingard, Wingard. They chose him to be their commander. So he planned several counteroffensives to stop the Nazis from advancing. But times have changed. The Nazi blitzkrieg's not anything like we've seen before. They didn't fight like they did in World War I. They just came like gangbusters when you didn't expect it. So when, see, uh, uh, the, the French would go to an area where they were hoping to stop at a certain point, to their amazement, the Nazis had already went right through there. So they went to another, see, a counteroffensive, and the Germans had already went through there. So all their counteroffensive to stop the advance didn't work because the Nazi had already went through. And then the commander-in-chief of France told his uh, cabinet, we should surrender. And people called him a traitor. Well, the Germans circled seven cities. And now all the Allied forces were see, withdrawn to an area called Dunkirk. 400,000, mostly British, a lot of French, some Dutch, Belgium, and other see, uh, soldiers, Allied soldiers, had retreated to Dunkirk. And you see the French premier says, now that Belgium had see, capitulated, and now that the French had 
uh, largely weren't able to stop the Germans. The Germans have a clear road straight to Dunkirk, where the Allied soldiers are more or less cornered. And they sent out these flyers. Look at this Nazi propaganda. They fly over the Allied, dropping these leaflets. And look what it says here. You see on the left, it says, you, that means the British and the Allies, so we surround you. And look what they wrote here. If you can see it in tiny print, it says, British soldiers, look at this map. It gives you your true situation. Your troops are entirely surrounded. Stop fighting. Put down your arms. And he says, if you want, if you surrender, you will survive. If you don't, you will die. So they are cornered on north, south, and as well as east and to the west, you have the English Channel. So they were surrounded. During this time here, the Germans said in a matter of hours, the British and Allied force will be captured or wiped out. It's a matter of hours and the war will be over. The Allies felt resigned that they were going to lose. I mean, what can we do? While thousands of Allied troops were trapped at Dunkirk, look at it, all they had to have artillery just land there and you could see uh, the depth and the Luftwaffe would just fly over and strike the areas with the uh, Messerschmitt and others and uh, it would be heavy casualty. But while thousands of Allied troops are trapped at Dunkirk, Thousands flock to church to pray for them on National Day of Prayer. When see King George VI declare the day before they were going to begin the evacuation at Dunkirk, they asked for all Englishmen and people of good faith everywhere to go to church and pray. So as many as were trapped at Dunkirk, many more so were at home praying. We recently had a National Day of Prayer uh, see here in America. I wonder how many of us even pray or even with the church during that time. But we can consider what happened there. A miracle happened. Well, a miracle is how it was described. What happened was that even though within a matter of hours of defeat, Surprisingly, Adolf Hitler pulled back his uh, motorized tank division. Everyone was stunned. The Panzer tank division were unstoppable. They were more faster and efficient than those helped by the Allies. The Americans were not involved. The French were outdated. But the, uh, the German the Panzer tank divisions were pulled back. If Adolf Hitler had just pushed on, they could have wiped out the Allied forces or captured uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands of soldiers. But instead, he pulled back. There are speculations by military theorists or strategists as to why he did that. And yeah, I can discuss it later if you're interested. But it's like the answer of a miracle, answer of prayer. It gave the Allied forces opportunity to send the most, the most largest, the massive military evacuation in history. Over 1,500 ships, tugboats, pleasure crews, private sea boats, fishing boats, yachts, uh, people of good faith, whether you were Germans or uh, uh, Dutch or you were uh, British or who just sympathized with the Allied cause. They came. They came and they transported the trapped Allies to England, to Dover and other places, while see the German planes, submarines and ships sank and fired at these uh, fishing vessels and what's called a small vessel. Of the 1,500 ships, about 800 of them were not military ships. They were private vessels. But they were sent there to save the people. And you can see pictures of these. Uh, these are not from movies. These are actual photographs. Uh, people was trying to save uh, soldiers to bring them to England. 
Not that they are running from battle, but they are evacuating so they can fight another day when things were looking hopeless. Operation Dynamo. Despite the miracle, people still thought the war was lost. But it was a miracle because how many people were saved? Over a period of nine days, 338,000 soldiers were evacuated. But nonetheless, some said, the war still lost. We've left behind over 80,000 vehicles that now the Germans are going to use. 76,000 tons of ammunition that are restocking the German sea military. Thousands of weapons and guns that they're going to use against us. We escaped, but many thought the war was lost. Most of the soldiers at Dunkirk were relieved that they were going to be evacuated, but they were frightened to their boots. They were freezing in the morning weather. It was hopeless, they felt. They were exhausted, they were depressed, overwhelmed. There's no way we can get out of this. But then came the miracle. Adolf Hitler, instead of pushing on as his advisors told him to do, to go in for the kill, Adolf Hitler says, pull back. We need to save the fuel. He remembered from his battles in World War I how the uh, outdated the, uh, motorized tanks got bogged down in the mud. He didn't want his tanks to get caught in the marsh and bogs up there, so he held back. Do you sometimes feel that way in your spiritual life? Are you happy with your situation? Do you sometimes feel like life has no purpose? Do you feel exhausted and no energy pressed? Do you feel your situation at work? or at school is just overwhelming and that you're all alone and that you're corner and you're going to be done in? Well, that's how they felt. But look what happened. They prayed and a miracle came. Winston Churchill, Sir Winston Churchill, he believed in providential history, which he believed that God was in control. Okay, admittedly, he didn't go to church regularly. Okay, so he was not one who went to church every single week. But he was a devout believer in Jesus Christ. His uh, nanny who raised him taught him well. And all through his youth and during World War II as prime minister, he prayed regularly and he believed that God somehow was in control. He didn't attend church always because he was busy with the business of war. Churchill, was he a modern-day Joseph? You remember Joseph in the Bible, the dreamer? He had a dream that the sun and the moon and the stars bowed down to him. Then he had dreamed of stalks of wheat, and they all bowed down to him. And his brothers were angry, and he sold them to uh, the median nice who sold them to slavery in Egypt. They said, you think you're going to be, you're better than us? But he had a dream that God had something great for him. Now, you hear these churches talk about, like they hear voices and all that stuff. And I, I think you better be very careful about people who claim they hear voices and claim that God talks to them. Look at Joseph. God never spoke to Joseph by voice. He never spoke to Joseph like he spoke to Isaac or Abraham or Moses. But he spoke to them only through dreams. Only through dreams. So don't think that God always speaks the way we think we need to vocally. Well, at 16 years of age, Winston Churchill said to one of his classmates, I see vast changes coming over a now peaceful world. I see great upheaval, wars, such as you cannot even imagine. I see London in danger and attack. At 16 years of age, says, I see myself as I play a very important part in the defense of London. 
and just weeks before the Battle of Britain, he was made Prime Minister on May 10, 1940. His source comes from the Hillsdale College uh, resource, the Churchill Project, a historian's uh, biography of Winston Churchill, and there's the website there. In the same way, we have to understand God has planned that when the right time is, he will arrange things, even though it may not seem that way. In the same way, when we were minors, we were also enslaved by this world system. We get brainwashed by television, by the news, fake news and all that. To slant you to the left, we slant you to the right, we slant you to the middle. But when the fulfillment of the time came, after 450 years of silence, God sent his son born through a woman and born under the law. This was so he could redeem those under the law so that we could be adopted. Well, four years later, something amazing happened. Four years to this day, a landing at Normandy Beach in France. Just like Dunkirk was the largest military evacuation in that period of time. At Normandy, which is also in northern France, but northwestern France, whereas Dunkirk was in northern France, it was the largest amphibious air, land, and sea invasion in history. They had hoped to catch the Germans off guard, the Germans were ready, but they fought well, they planned well, and it signaled the beginning of the end of World War II. 9,300 American soldiers died at Normandy. 4,000 died on the first day of the assault. They gave their lives so that we may have freedom today. This reminds me of the story about Legion and the application. In Mark chapter 5, verse 1 to 20, Jesus thought there was a man that uh, was carrying it himself. He had chains on it. He was like a madman. And Jesus recognized it wasn't insanity. They didn't need a, uh, a psychiatrist, not, lead, not for that particular problem. We need psych good psychiatrists for many other problems, but not for this one here. Because Jesus, the Lord of mankind, knew it was a demonic possession case. And then this, a voice came out of the man, and he says, my name is Legion, for I am many. And he's occupying this person's body. And then after she, the Lord asked him to leave, he went into the pigs and, you know, uh, the pigs ran down see the uh, cliff and drowned. There are demonic possessions in the world today. And the kingdom of God stands for everything the opposite, for goodness and righteousness, not what is necessarily popular or pleasurable, but that which works for peace and justice. In Romans chapter 12, the Bible says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual word. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. If you go by what you see on television or the news media or movies, yeah, you probably get a lot of good entertainment, but you probably won't find the God's will thereby here. Just as the first Allied soldier who landed on the beach in Normandy was the star of liberation of Europe, when Mary was told by the angel that you will bear the Christ child. In that moment, when the conception of Jesus began in one tiny cell in the womb of Mary, that began the invasion of the kingdom of God to liberate us from the sins of the world. And that is the day for us, deliverance day. The goal, see, in spiritual warfare is to displace the enemy. Right? It's not just to defeat the enemy and leave him there but to dispossess them, remove them. In the Old Testament, Israel's mission was to dispossess the Canaanites, 
and God told him, control the land. Now, some of the Israelites didn't follow God's word. They wanted to keep some of the booty, some of the uh, rewards of battle, some of the uh, sheep and cattle and other things, spoils of war, and disobey God. By keeping some of these things, oh yes, and idols. The Canaanite influence remained and eventually caused many of the Israelites to fall into idolatry and to fall away. But if we want to have dispossess these sinful influences are in our lives, we must be willing to remove these idols from our lives. Things that we hold on to that are worldly but are counterproductive to our spiritual growth. In Matthew chapter 12, it says the spiritual truth here. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, it goes to dry places, seeking rest and find none. You see, it's not good enough that you put everything in order. If an evil spirit should depart from you. But if you don't replace that vacuum with something holy and spiritual and good, then that evil spirit may just come right back. Verse 44, then that evil spirit says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. So he goes and takes seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. So shall it be with this wicked generation. Some of us are so-called good people. We know how not to do bad things, but do we know how to replace it with holy things in our lives? Are we holy? Holy means separated. It means we are different. We're not like the people that you see that are popular and rich and famous. No, there are many, of course, rich and famous Christians. Spiritual warfare is also displacement. The Allies' mission on D-Day was to free Europe by pushing Hitler's army to drive them out or to keep them under control in POW camp, if we can do that. It was not just to win and leave them freely roaming around. In the same way, we cannot allow sin to freely roam around us. As Christian, we must also learn to push these enemies, envy, jealousy, pride, anger, lust, and a worldly attitude that says, I don't care if we want to live victoriously for God. In 1 Peter chapter 2, lay aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and evil speaking, but desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Yes, let's get rid of these bad things. But are you desiring the pure milk of the word to grow? If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Okay, hold on here. Oh, oops. Stop here. Okay. Um, in Mark chapter 16, verse 14 and 16 here, it talks about the giving uh, of the uh, Great Commission. Just as uh, Nazi Germany held the world in its grip to conquer the entire world, so all the flag would flag under the swastika. We know that all are of God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one, the scripture says. And we as Christians, our goal is to preach the good news. Later, he appeared to the eleven as he sat at the table and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart. Put it out of the paper. The war is over. They have signed armistice. They have ceased surrendered. We must preach the spirit-filled love, the joy of service. In the past sermon, we talked about what happened in Japan under the Marshall Plan. The Americans brought in missionaries and uh, showed many of the Japanese uh, that fought on the other side kindness. And in doing so, many realized the goodwill of the American. So we must, as the church, we must spread the liberating message from town to town. 
just as the Allies went to town to town, liberating Europe, pockets of resistance in 1944. So that is our task. Know the word, spread the word, study the word of God. That's what we need to do. Are you a Dunkirk or are you a Normandy? Why did see we had the debacle in Dunkirk? A lack of preparation. People that didn't think that Germany would do what they did. A series of mistakes. Slowness of action. And many of the French had a lack of will. They gave up. A series of defeat and it forced a retreat to Dunkirk. And for many Christians, all they want to do is just retreat. They want to go to church and be saved, but they're afraid to speak of the church of faith. Let us not be like that. Once again, it's okay to evacuate to fight another day, but some want to evacuate just so they could run and hide. Okay. So we should be like at Normandy. Recognize that sacrifice is necessary and be willing, like the Apostle Paul and Peter, to take risks in order to advance forward in faith. So, in memory of this, here we need to understand this is the anniversary of D Day. If we learn the spiritual lesson, we'll recognize that we are here to advance the kingdom. Evacuate if we need to, but just for a moment or season in time. So that we can continue to struggle ahead to pave the way for the Lord coming, Aranatha.